want to uh, introduce and thank uh, Jana Pastina for, for joining us today. Um, Jana is an, an, an alumna of um, the Golden Gate University School of Law. And so we were just sort of talking about the law school um, and maybe still are as you're joining us. So welcome. Um, um, I'm Mark Singer. I'm the Dean of Undergraduate Studies at Golden Gate University. And we're um, here today, I guess, to to chat with uh, Jana about um, what life is like to, uh, you know, as a, as a restaurant owner in, in the Bay Area. Um, wait, I've got a little bio of you, Jana. I'm just going to read that so people are situated properly. Great. Oh, and before I do that, I should say, just to reiterate what um, Joyce just um, put in the chat there, um, this is being recorded, right? Um, everyone's been muted on entry. Um, we'd love to take your questions, um, you know, for later on in this um, conversation. There is a Q&A button on the bottom of the Zoom window. So, um, oh, and there's Joyce is way ahead of me with that. Okay, thanks, Joyce. <laughs> um, so please enter your questions if you have any uh, in the Q&A um, section, and we will get to those um, as soon as we can. All right, so, so Jana Pastina is a passionate Oakland resident. Her family moved to Oakland when she was two years old. She's a graduate of uh, Oakland's Mills College, where she earned a degree in ethnic studies, and then she graduated from Golden Gate University School of Law in 2012. Um, Jana and her husband, Chris, uh, use their culinary and social justice backgrounds to give back to Oakland and open their restaurants. So they've got three uh, currently in Oakland, um, Chop Bar, Calavera, and uh, Tribune Tavern. Uh, John is most proud of creating places for community and creating good jobs um, for Oakland's diverse residents and helping Oakland grow into what it is now, a, a leading culinary destination in the United States. Um, and John also currently sits on the boards of uh, Children's Fairyland in Oakland and The Crucible. Uh, and she and uh, her husband, Chris, use their influence in Oakland to support charitable causes that support children, music, the arts, and um, the, the fight against homelessness. So, so welcome, Jana. Thanks so much for, for joining us today. Absolutely, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh yeah, no, I'm, I'm really excited to talk with you. Um, first things first, I've already read a little bit of your bio, but um, what's not clear here, what many people I'm sure are wanting to know is, so you graduated from the law school in 2012. Mm -hmm. How does one move from that to doing what you do now, you know, owning restaurants. Is that, is that a, just a clear career path that they lay out for you when you graduate or what happens? There? Absolutely not. Um, nothing was, uh, this was not a straight path at all. So I actually started out in the re restaurant industry before going to law school. Um, I was a bartender for many, many years. Um, then I met my husband, which is a whole, a, long, a nice long other story, but we met in New Orleans in 2004 at Jazz Fest. Um, he had owned a restaurant and jazz club in San Francisco called Bruno's um, during that time. Um, and I was bartending and we had a bunch of restaurant industry friends. Um, and then as we started um, to have a more formal relationship, um, I decided to go back to law school. Um, I love bartending, but for me personally, uh, couldn't be a long-term career in terms of um, the physical, it's really physical, um, and late hours and, you know, long nights. Uh, so I decided to go back to school and then go to law school, um, and I found myself at GGU. So not a, not a straight path. Um, after law school, um, it was, you know, I had to try to decide whether I was going to go the traditional law path or what, what else was I going to do. So um, at that point, we had opened a couple more restaurants and we really needed help uh, with our business formations, with some of our in-house legal work, and also to form our HR department and really solidify, um, you know, make a, a welcoming place, but also a structured place for people to come work at. And that's what I decided to do. It was the best way to help us move forward in, uh, with our future. Um, and I, I really I took to it right away. I actually enjoyed it much more than I thought I was going to and I have been doing that ever since. Wait, so you're saying that your law degree is somehow relevant to your work today? Yeah, def absolutely. <laughs> I mean, it, you know, one is just helping us with any um, pretty, uh, um, you know, straightforward legal work that we need. Obviously, we have outside counsel for things that are uh, much more um, 
maybe severe <laughs> at times. Um, but, you know, internally, I can do a lot of that work for us. And then, you know, employment law in California, as many of you know, is very um, complicated. So to have a lawyer um, be able to be on staff um, and help navigate some of those uh, rules, especially for the restaurant industry, because they don't always translate very directly to the restaurant industry. So it takes some um, interpretation. And uh, I work hard with our other HR staff um, and our outside counsel to make sure that we're interpreting them for us the best that we can. Okay, great. So, so then aside from HR and, and various legal issues that you have to manage on a regular basis, um, I know this, is, this will seem like a simple-minded question, but um, I'm going to ask it anyway. So besides that, what does a restaurant owner actually do? Great question, because um, I think that people don't always know. Um, first and foremost, uh, what we do, especially for independent businesses, um, we create experiences. Uh, we create places of community. That's the most important thing. Um, when we, con when we um, conceptualize a restaurant, it's absolutely about where is the restaurant? What, is, what community is it in? Um, and how can we make our restaurant a center point for the community, a place where people can gather, um, they can love, they can celebrate, they can cry and mourn, um, they can escape from the real world, quote unquote, um, and really have an experience. Um, so that's really first and foremost, that's what we do. And then there's like the more technical aspects of it from you know conceptualizing, designing, um, executing the design and the concept, um, you know, building and training your staff. Uh, it's really important that our staff, one, reflects the community that we are in. So we want our staff to look like the communities that we are in. It's really important for us to um, hire and retain and promote um, black and brown people. Um, not only um, for the kitchen, but also for our front of the house staff and our leadership positions as well. Um, and if they don't look like the community, then uh, we haven't been doing something right. Um, and then, you know, you want to make sure that you're training people so that they also know what customer service really is and what it means to take really good care of your guests um, and build a local clientele. And then you want to make sure that you're always um, adapting and, and um, not changing, but adapting because you want to keep your concepts fresh. And so you can't, you know, it's not just a cookie cutter. Not every restaurant is the same. Even if you own, like my husband and I do, more than one restaurant, each one is different. Mm -hmm. um, and you want to make sure that your menus are updated, your cocktail lists are updated, and things are always um, new and exciting, especially if you're building a strong repeat customer base. Um, you want them to have new things to come experience all the time. Um, but of course, there's always those favorites that people want to come back to and see all the time as well. Yeah, I remember reading somewhere that the average restaurant survives maybe three years. I mean, yeah. then there are other ones that'll stay around for 50 years, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, restaurants, uh, restaurant profit margins are really slim. They're about one to 3%. Um, and so for the first year, uh, literally you're bleeding money <laughs> and you're just trying to stay afloat um, and get to a point where you're breaking even and then you can start to um, generate some profit after that. So a lot of restaurants fail in the first year um, and it's not, you know, it's not always the fault of the person who's running the restaurant. It could be a number of factors that are outside of their control. Um, and you really just have to, in our experience, and again, everybody's is a little bit different. In our experience, it's really sticking to your concept, um, sticking to your vision, and, and not being too reactionary. So for instance, if you have one bad day, or you have uh, one bad review, um, also, absolutely you wanna take it into consideration what those comments are, but you shouldn't um, be reactionary and just change your concept all, all together at, you know, suddenly, um, especially because that creates confusion for everybody. So sometimes you just got to stay the course, uh, believe in your concept, believe in your path and, and, and do your best. Um, there's, it's, you know, obviously very complicated. Financing goes into it. Um, some restaurants have investments, investment dollars. Um, and so it's just really finding a way to survive that first year um, and then start to build um, capital. Well, but all of that, and you know, uh, concept and just, just um, thinking about who you're, you know, who you're hiring and how they reflect the community, all the things you talked about, 
all of that's got to be upended by, or at least challenged by what's going on right now. I mean, I mean, the, the, the restaurant industry has obviously been affected by the, the pandemic. I, I mean, ha, how has that affected your, your approach or how your business is going? Yeah, it has been very difficult, very, very difficult. Um, you know, when the order came down um, that everyone had to shelter in place and, and close, um, it was an incredibly hard decision for um, Chris, who's my husband, Chris and myself. And uh, we did a couple of things, as did many of our restaurant colleagues in, in the um, local industry. And I'm sure nationwide, it was the same sort of decisions they had to make. Um, one is, you know, we had to lay off all of our staff. So uh, about 160 employees um, between the three restaurants, um, which is heartbreaking. Um, for Chris and I, we made a commitment to do a couple of things. One, we have um, employees who don't qualify for unemployment. Um, and so we continue to support them um, with our own personal funds um, during that time because they have families to take care of as well. Um, the second thing that we decided to do um, was to pay for health insurance for as long as we possibly could, again, with our own funds, um, literally emptied our bank accounts um, so that those who are enrolled in health insurance could be covered for, um, we were able to cover people to July 1st, um, which got us through uh, our shelter in place. Um, and we just couldn't imagine leaving people without health insurance in the middle of a pandemic. Um, that would have been, um, con you know, our, we couldn't have lived with ourselves if, if we couldn't have done something. And we know that's not, um, this is a common story. Uh, many, many of our colleagues did the exact same things, took out second mor mortgages on their homes, you know, um, you know, sacrificed their futures to do the very same thing for the people that they work with. Um, you know, and then it's worry. Then you just worry. You worry for weeks. We worried. Um, we didn't know what it was going to look like. And, um, and then, you know, it was, we had this huge national movement, which was beautiful. Um, you know, uh, it was unfortunate that it resulted out of the um, murder of George Floyd and our condolences um, continue to go out to him and his family. Um, but we saw something in this country happen that was absolutely amazing that I don't think we've really seen for a long time. And then it took, it was like fire. It took on a, a life of its own across the world. And it was so important um, to be part of that, um, part of that movement locally here in Oakland, um, where Oakland has always been known for its diversity. Large populations of black and brown people um, who, you know, are facing displacement because of, um, you know, the negative sides of gentrification because of the rising rents, um, you know, the, the city is looking different. So it was really beautiful to see the community come out in force. Um, and we were absolutely a part of that. Um, and then, you know, unfortunately, there's an element that, that tends to glom on to protests that, and they're not part of the protests who create destruction um, and they loot. And um, unfortunately, we were affected by that at Tribune. We had our windows broken. Um, right. You know, my husband, Chris, we, you know, he was there and then he decided to leave. Uh, everything seemed fine. And literally the minute he walked in the door, we got a call that the windows were broken and he had to go right back to the restaurant. Um, and he found people inside trying to take things. And one of them did uh, take a swing at him. Um, and he was, uh, he didn't, he made contact. The guy who took a swing at him made contact but it wasn't really um, it was kind of like a, a like a, a weird effort and then he ran away um, it was just heartbreaking it was heartbreaking to be closed for so long um, and then have you know have our restaurant vandalized um, our restaurants are there are children you know Chris and I don't have children we've dedicated our whole lives to doing this um, and it was heartbreaking um, but another beautiful thing happened uh, and the community showed up. Um, a good friend of ours, uh, Jonathan, reached out. He asked what he, what he could do. Um, and he became uh, what he calls an accidental organizer. Um, he reached out to his friends, his artist community, and they came out in force and cleaned up. And it wasn't just our business. Our neighborhood where Tribune is was, was affected. Almost every business was affected. Some much more, uh, much worse than ours. And um, the community showed up, they cleaned up, they boarded up windows, and then the artists came out and they painted these incredible, 
murals, this resistance art that has come out of this, um, this movement is absolutely inspiring. And all of Oakland turned into a, an art walk. I mean, you could walk from the end of Broadway and Jack London Square to the other end of Broadway up to Piedmont and all the neighborhoods in between. Um, and I'm sure other neighborhoods that I didn't even get to get to where there were just these beautiful murals and it was inspiring. Um, and so with, with the bad um, comes the good. Right. And um, I just, you know, Chris and I hold on to that, that we have this incredible community um, that we're a part of um, and that supports each other when the chips are down. That's, uh, that's, that's great. And, and those murals are still there. I, you, know, yeah. you know, most of them, what I, I've seen them still there. Yeah, um, many are still there. And I should mention that there's a, um, a huge movement to preserve them. So, um, you know, I don't know all of the players, and I'm sorry if I forget some, but the Oakland Museum of California, the Renan Foundation, um, there's the uh, Black Cultural Zone. A lot of these organizations are coming together to preserve this art. And so in the coming months, we should be able to visit places and, and um, be able to see the work that the artists um, have done. Well, and your, your restaurants are now open, right? I mean, in a much more limited way than you were before, of course, but you're yeah. able to sort of move forward um, and, and bring some of your folks back, I think. Yeah, we, um, so we are open for to-go, uh, for pickup and delivery, and our outdoor spaces are open. Um, you know, it's, uh, it is, first it is, we're fortunate that we have the outdoor space and we're able to, um, you know, open in this limited capacity. Um, however, it's not the model that we um, got into this business to do because they aren't currently, um, you know, we're not able to create those experiences that we want to have for people and that we want people to have. Um, you know, people are being served in, you know, to-go boxes and everyone is wearing a mask and everyone is far apart from each other. And um, it is, it sustains us for now, um, but it's not the model that we you know, that we've gotten to this business to do. Um, you know, I should also mention, and I think that um, it's important to mention that World Central Kitchen um, is an organization that um, feeds uh, the hungry and feeds uh, underserved communities. Yeah, you know, I was going to ask you about them because you're, you're talking about the community that is Oakland, and I want to get back to that also. But yeah. there's also this larger restaurant community, which is really national or even international, right? And, and World Central Kitchen is one of those organizations that's thinking about the restaurant community. That, that's that's my sense of it. I mean, yeah. they, I know they connect restaurants, farmers, suppliers, and communities. Can can you talk a little bit about how you're working with them? Yeah, so, um, you know, anybody who's interested to learn about them can go to wck.org. Um, and uh, there is a very well-known chef, a very well-respected chef, Jose Andres, and his wife, Patricia, started this organization. Um, and they've responded to and, uh, lots of disasters, uh, you know, the Puerto Rico, um, Haiti, and they, they feed the people and they're, they're coming up with smart solutions to combat hunger um, and poverty. And it's incredible what they're doing. Um, locally, and in my opinion, they are single-handedly propping up the restaurant industry right now. Um, they have partnered with Aisha and Stephen Curry's foundation, Eat, Play, Learn. Um, and they are, so what they do is they buy meals from restaurants and they use those meals to feed um, people in need around the, in the community. Right. So they'll, they'll um, give them to other nonprofits, um, they, a range of different nonprofits. Uh, they buy the meals from us, which is really important <laughs> to mention. Um, on top of restaurants like ours, donate also to this organization. Um, but because they're buying the meals from us, we're allowed to um, sustain what we're doing right now. Without World Central Kitchen, um, we wouldn't, and many restaurants wouldn't be in operation right now. And so it's, it's really incredible. Again, it's another one of these things that has come out of this um, really unfortunate situation, but they're able to um, help the restaurant industry and they are also able to feed the community at the same time as they're supporting, you know, farmers and other small suppliers in the supply chain. Um, and it has been inspiring. Again, another Another thing that has inspired my faith and my community um, out of what's going on. No, it was really heartbreaking to read a few weeks ago, I think, where uh, these farmers who were having to basically just 
destroy their crops because they couldn't get them to market and you know they couldn't get them to the people who at the same time were desperate for for meals you know and so so an organization like this is really just connecting all the dots and then then of course it's helping you get your employees back to work as well. And yeah, absolutely. So um, what we did first was invited um, the employees who couldn't qualify for unemployment um, back first. And so they came and uh, our management staff came back as well. Um, at this time, we're operating uh, with a pretty much a skeleton crew. Uh, we're not, you know, we're, we are down, our business is down like 70% or more, and so we're not able to invite everybody back at this time, um, which is heartbreaking for them um, and for us. And considering that you know the federal government is um, arguing over this extra six hundred dollars that um, a week that they're offering in unemployment, um, this could be potentially devastating in the next couple weeks. And so um, we're hopeful and really advocating for you know the federal government to step up and, and take care of the people while while the businesses. Um, aren't able to and you know we would all every person I know who owns a restaurant would what much prefer to be operational fully operational and have their staff back and as soon as we can do that um, we we can't wait you know it, it, it's it's interesting the, the way you're talking about this too because you know restaurants are so much a part of what defines a community and not just a not you know um, it's the streets it's the people but it's it's also those experiences that you were talking about that creating for folks and um, all of this is really a challenge to that sense of what makes a community. Um, you know, we had somebody on a few weeks ago from um, BRV and they, they helped to do the programming at uh, Salesforce Park. And um, we talked a lot about this idea of placemaking, you know, and restaurants are really part of what makes a, a place. Um, and that's at least, well, are, are you trying to, are you finding creative ways to continue to, contribute to that sense of place or that sense of what an experience like this ought to be? I... Yeah, um, you know, we're doing the best we can, you know, for us. So for instance, for Father's Day, we, we would normally have a giant um, barbecue, a giant pig roast, and hundreds of people would come out um, and we'd celebrate fathers. And so this year we weren't able to do that, but we still roasted a pig and had it available to pick up for dads for their Father's Day meals. Um, so, and, and our social media, keeping our social media really up to date, um, you know, making sure we're staying connected. But, and I, I'm sure as people know, um, nonprofits absolutely rely on small businesses, not only restaurants, but lots of small businesses donate probably um, until it hurts to their local community organizations. Mm -hmm. And with us being closed and other independent businesses not being able to operate right now, those donations to nonprofits have dried up. Um, so I, you know, it makes it really difficult because we're not able to fully participate in the ways, in, in community, in the ways that we have been. Um, you know, even holding events for nonprofits in our space, you know, so that they can do their fundraisers. Like those are things that we're, we're not able to do right now. And it feels, um, it feels a little lonely, to be honest with you, to not to have these connections to um, our nonprofit partners um, and the other members of our community who come out two, three times a week um, to be part of, you know, the restaurant and part of the the other people in the community, they really are gathering places. And when you said um, placemaking, absolutely, yeah. restaurants are often the center of community. It's kind of like the kitchen in a home is the center of the home. Um, restaurants often operate in that same way. Um, and it's lonely not to be able to do yeah. that right now. Yeah, and, and I wanna mention this, I, I've just shared um, my screen briefly. This is from your Tribune Tavern, uh, Tavern webpage. Um, on your website, and this is something that really struck me, you have a tab that's org support, it's organizations we support. And, and just as you're talking about, you're not sort of um, operating in a vacuum. You, you, you're very much thinking of what you do as part of the community. And here's yeah. a long list of organizations like the ones you're talking about, nonprofits that, um, that you support and that, that continue to need support while, um, you know, while we're experiencing this pandemic, right? There's, there's, yeah. there's that real challenge that you, know, you can't provide them the kind of support, I think that uh, you might have uh, otherwise or that you did otherwise. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, again, this is not an uncommon story for all of my restaurant colleagues. Um, the number of organizations we support um, 
you know, whether it's fi you know, financial support, um, you know, our time, food, uh, gift certificates, uh, you know, silent auction items, um, auction items. Uh, these are the things that we do and we're dedicated to doing that. Um, I think that, you know, as people, for, in, for example, you know, as people who came up through the restaurant industry, Chris and I, um, you know, started out as bussers and dishwashers and cocktail waitresses and worked our way up. Um, we absolutely understand what it means to give back to the community. And we purposefully uh, built our restaurants in Oakland. Um, you know, we could have, you know, Chris grew up on the East Coast. We could have decided to open up restaurants um, anywhere we wanted and we purposefully did it here in Oakland so that we could be a part of the nonprofits and, and supporting the community work they're doing. Um, you know, I know it sounds cliche, but it takes a community. Like we can't do this in a vacuum and we all need to participate. Um, and just like my restaurant colleagues, we all give till it hurts. We probably donate far more than, you know, um, if our accountants would want us to. <laughs> and, um, I, you know, I feel so much for these nonprofits as their donations have, you know, dried up and those that operate, you know, I, I can speak personally to the two that I sit on the board, which is Fairyland and the Crucible. Um, if they're not open for business, you know, just like us, there's no revenue coming in. Right. And mm -hmm. um, these are organizations that are trying, working really hard to find creative ways to raise money right now. They're not able to have their galas. They're not able to hold other events around, um, you know, fundraising, they're not able to open their doors um, in terms of letting, you know, patrons in uh, to enjoy their spaces. And um, they're also um, have a workforce that's not able to get back to work right now. They're very much in danger of not being able to reopen if they can't find other creative ways to find support. Um, and so we've had to change what we're doing. Um, we're also now out there asking people to support these organizations because mm -hmm. we're, you know, we're not able to give out our dollars the way that we'd like to, um, but the community can. And so we're hopeful that they're going to show up just like they have shown us over the last several months that they show up. Um, and it's so important. That's great. No, that's, and, and we'll, we'll post links to all of this in the, the comments. This will be posted to our YouTube site um, shortly after we're done and people who want to have links to these organizations as well as to the page that I just showed, you know, can, can find that there. So thanks for, for talking about that. And I, I, you mentioned, um, before, um, uh, you know, George, George Floyd's murder and, and the, uh, the protests that, uh, that followed that and some of the challenges that posed for you, um, that continues to be an ongoing issue for folks. And, and I'm just wondering, uh, you talked about a bit how you responded. Um, what should people be doing now? I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's quieted down. There's not as much um, of a visible protest um, movement that you see in Oakland. There's still some, but, um, but um, that aside, what should people be doing now? Do you have a sense of that? Uh, yeah. um, find a way to be active. Um, you know, it, it looks different for everyone. So there's not, there's just not one way to be an advocate or, you know, to be an activist. There are many ways. Um, and one size does not fit all. Some people will get out there and they'll march in the streets. Other people will write letters. Other people will make phone calls. Um, you know, so just find a way, find any way that you feel comfortable participating in this incredible movement that we're in the middle of and participate. Um, don't be silent don't do nothing. <laughs> so do something. Um, and probably most importantly, vote. Please vote. Please vote in November. Um, you know, if we want to see real change, real, real change that's sustainable, we need to show up at the polls and um, make our, our decisions and our, our desires heard and make our choices heard. Um, because the way that things are right now, there's not going to, you know, we're not, we're not going to be able to, to sustain very much um, in terms of progress with, with the way that things are right now. There has to be some real intense change. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I have a lot of friends who feel like the choices that they have to choose from in November are not great. And I hear them. Um, but it's still important to show up. And, you know, for, you know, for black and brown people, for women, um, I know we've all heard it before, but a lot of people sacrificed a lot of things, um, a lot of injuries, death, 
despair so that we could show up at the polls and vote. And the best thing that we can do um, is show up for them. No, absolutely right. And there's been movements that, uh, you know, to support black owned businesses as well. And, and, yeah. and uh, there, there are many ways that people can show their support and, and actually be supportive. And, which reminds me, um, something you and I talked about before this um, and before now, um, oh, and I should say, I'm sorry, if folks have questions, I, and, and we really welcome your questions, please post them in the Q&A, which is down at the bottom of your screen. Uh, I see the one person posted in the chat, and we'll, we'll get to that. But um, by all means, please, if you have a question, put it in the Q&A down below. Um, but there was, there was a stat you and I were discussing uh, a couple weeks ago. So it's, it's, for the most part, still up to date, I think. Um, but um, the folks at uh, UC Santa Cruz did some research that indicated that um, since early February, 41% of black owned businesses have permanently closed across the country. Um, and compare, that's compared with 17% of white owned businesses. So it's more than double. Um, so that represents, I think, a, a, a real challenge. Um, I wonder if you could speak to that. Um, what are the challenges facing uh, black owned businesses? And, and what do you think might be the cause of some of those disparities that we're seeing in those numbers? Um, well, my, my fear is, is that it, it may only um, get worse at this point. We're going to see a lot more uh, business closures um, across the board, and it does absolutely affect um, Black businesses and uh, businesses owned by people of color more than other businesses, uh, more than white-owned businesses. And there are a number of reasons for that. Um, one is, you know, as I said before, restaurant margins are pretty slim. And when you're um, trying to open a restaurant, uh, capital is everything, having some extra money in the bank. Um, and that gets eaten up really fast. You know, uh, one thing breaks, you know, you're closed for two weeks, business is down, you know, 15% for a week and your reserves are gone really quickly. Um, so I think that this is illustrative of, of a systemic problem um, in uh, funding for black and brown businesses. Um, it's very, um, this systemic um, racism in lending makes it much harder to get a loan. But let's remember, loans for small businesses are also a problem um, because you're saddled with debt. And if your, rest if your margins are already pretty slim, having this extra debt um, just puts you behind, right? And it, you, it's really hard to get ahead if, if you're financing your operation on loans. Um, investor dollars are also much harder to get for black and brown owned businesses, especially if you're not, um, don't have a celebrity name yet. Or um, you know, or some proven track record of um, success. Um, it's very hard to get people to give you to invest in you um, and to believe in you. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, right now, uh, to your point, we're seeing a, a shift in terms of people's awareness um, that one thing that they can do is support black businesses and support black and brown owned businesses. Um, you know, instead of, you know, going on and uh, ordering from Amazon, you know, jump online and see if there's somebody in your neighborhood that might sell the same product. Um, sometimes it does mean having to pay a little bit extra for something and you have to be willing to do that. And that's because a, an organization, a giant organization, a corporate organization has buying power and they get great prices because they can buy far more uh, they can buy in bulk um, than an independent business can. Um, you know, and I think that a lot of times um, black and brown owned businesses also don't get the PR. They don't get the media attention. Um, it's hard for them to um, be noticed in a crowded field. And uh, I think we see that changing too. There are quite a few organizations um, who are working right now to raise the awareness um, and the um, and the uh, just the um, visibility of black and brown owned businesses. I had a great call recently with an organization called uh, Shade, and they absolutely are um, committed to helping black and brown owned businesses with their marketing. Um, and so we talked a lot about what can black and brown owned businesses do, what kind of help can they use in, or in order to raise their profile. Um, so it's financing, it's awareness, um, it's PR and media. Um, these are all things that have some systemic problems um, that, that, we're, you know, that we're trying to address now. 
Um, but it's going to take some work and it's going to take all of our commitment to get there. Yeah, no, and, and I think that question of scale that you mentioned is also huge, right? If, you, if you're looking at a national um, or international corporation, you know, and, and, and that's compared with something that's more of a startup as you are, you're going to have challenges. Somebody asked a question earlier about um, staffing, like how do you, in, in a place like the Bay Area that's so expensive, yeah. cool. just the staffing costs that have to be one of those things that makes it hard to compete, you know, with absolutely. With um, so it's imperative that we pay as much as we can, right? And and we and we we try our best to do that, um, because it is so expensive mm -hmm. to live in the Bay Area. Um, you know, helping to advocate for an increase in minimum wage. Uh, we all work as a you know a lot of our rest um, a lot of my restaurant colleagues. We work together to do that. Um, in, in a way that's sustainable um, for, for independent businesses as well. Um, you know, providing health care, providing other benefits is really, really important and something that Chris and I are dedicated to, um, something that um, my other restaurant col colleagues are absolutely dedicated to. Um, these, these things, which may seem small on some level, um, really help people to try to stay in the and stay in their communities and stay in their neighborhoods. However, we have seen over the last several years, um, you know, people are having to move farther and farther away from places like Oakland and San Francisco. Um, and while they have every good intention of continuing to work in Oakland and San Francisco, um, it's just not possible with the uh, amount of time, um, energy, and money it costs to commute. So. Um, there are a lot of different models going around right now about how to solve this problem of um, paying a living wage um, and supporting independent businesses as as we try to do that. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't think that there's one right answer, especially right now. Um, but as long as we continue that commitment to doing as much as we can where we can, I think that we'll hold on. However, um, you know, for us, you know, for my independent business colleagues, um, this is going to be, we're not going to be fully operational for at least the rest of this year and, and most likely into next year, which means that while we have invited maybe a quarter of our staff back, we have three quarters of our staff who are out of work. Um, and an unemployment rate that I think is at like 13 and a half percent right now, if I remember correctly, um, you know, and still like 30 or so million people out of work. And so I don't know the answer um, moving forward. I think that this is something um, that is unfortunately going to get worse um, before it gets better. Um, and so I think what a lot of uh, independent businesses are doing is helping um, the people that they can right now. Right. Um, and that is not everybody and it's not even half of everybody, um, <laughs> but it's, it's what we can do. Yeah. And, and you don't have the benefit of some of the larger, um, companies like some of the big tech firms, for instance, in the Bay area, um, who can encourage their, their employees to work remotely, you know, right. and they're actually telling them, yeah, you should move away. You know, it'll, it'll save you on costs. Right. Obviously a restaurant, you, you can't have a waiter, you know, a working oh. from, from Georgia or something like that. If it, right. Well, so frontline workers um, have fewer, far fewer options, right? Um, and right now, um, unfortunately for those who don't uh, qualify for unemployment, their only option is to show up for work um, if, if their workplace is open. Um, and that's exposing them to a lot of different um, challenges right now. It's exposing them to potentially um, COVID transmission. Um, it's exposing their families um, at a time where other people and other industries get the choice. Um, and so it's, it's an incredibly um, devastating choice to choose between feeding your family um, or, you know, getting sick. Um, so a lot of businesses that are open are open um, for the purpose of supporting those people who don't qualify for unemployment, as well as supporting um, those people enrolled in health insurance to be able to maintain their health insurance. And for some of us, those are really uh, the key reasons why we're open right now. Otherwise, we would be closed. Um, and a, an absolute commitment to um, our sanitation efforts in, in keeping the places um, as clean as possible and keeping our um, staff as distant from our, our guests as possible, which is again, like I said before, is not the model that we can do. Um, but 
uh, Chris and I have worked really hard to put in um, parameters using, you know, CDC guidelines, using OSHA guidelines, um, using restaurant, you know, there's restaurant association guidelines about how to best protect our staff. Um, and we've implemented some pretty stringent rules um, surrounding protecting those that do and, and are showing up to work. Yeah. So you're anticipating a question that well, I'm going to ask you anyway, but you've already answered a, a good bit of it. And, and I know a lot of those, those OSHA and CDC guidelines are evolving and we're figuring out more and more. All the time. Yeah, that's, which is, can be a challenge, I suppose. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, again, this is something you and I talked about, I think. Um, um, so, so the food writer for the uh, San Francisco Chronicle, Soleil Ho, um, said that um, until there's a vaccine, she won't eat at a restaurant because um, she's concerned about the restaurant workers there. And she thinks by, by going to these restaurants, um, she's somehow um, contributing to putting their, their lives in, at, at risk. You know? And others say, and I think you're sort of leaning this way too, but uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, um, that many of these workers would really have no other source of income. And so it's, it's sort of a, a, you know, an impossible choice. You know? So um, how, how do you decide how and where to strike that balance? Yeah. Um, well, um, you know, Ms. Ho is not wrong at all. <laughs> um, it is a incredibly difficult decision. Um, and we thought about it for a long time. And uh, we actually did not open for to go uh, right away. We closed everything down for several weeks before, to one, make sure that we could um, build procedures around safety and implement them properly. Um, so that was number one. Um, this, you know, Second was we do have, um, as do a lot of restaurants, have um, a segment of workers who are not eligible for unemployment. And um, as I mentioned before, Chris and I and my restaurant colleagues have done everything we can to support them um, without being open. And we did that until there was nothing left. Um, and so we felt um, that we had some, an obligation to open back up very minimally um, to bring those people back to work who don't uh, qualify for unemployment. Um, and again, um, if we weren't open, uh, July 1st, we would have had to cancel everybody's health insurance. Um, mm -hmm. And that was just not a good um, option for us. And, you know, we're not the only ones, but many of us have people on our insurance who have, um, you know, illnesses that need constant care. Um, and to leave them without an option felt heartbreaking as well. I think this highlights and illustrates a much bigger problem yeah. that independent businesses can't solve on their own. However, we've been shouldered with the burden of solving it. Um, and that is, is that we need some, we need um, a few things in this country. One is universal health care, right? If, if we had universal health care, that would take this really difficult decision out of um, trying to decide whether we're putting people's health at risk versus um, making sure they have money to put food on their tables. Um, the other thing is, a, 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 which I you know, absolutely believe in, is a, a minimum guaranteed income, like a universal income. Um, if, if that was something that we had in this country, this shutdown would not be so devastating. Um, and I think those are two things that we could work together, work toward as a country to take care of our most vulnerable populations so that we're not putting them in jeopardy of being, um, you know, hurt or injured or getting sick during uh, something, uh, during a pandemic that has taken off in a way um, that none of us anticipated. Right, exactly. Wow. Yeah, no, that's right. I was thinking that as you were talking, I was like, yeah, that's... Um uh, people have to go to work and put their, you know, their health possibly at risk because they need the health insurance that, that they can only obtain through a work-related uh, okay. program. It's, uh, yeah. Um, well, John, I, I really want to thank you for taking the time here. I, I feel like, I, I hope people didn't tune in thinking we were going to do like recipes and stuff. We should have done that. We probably should have thrown a few recipes. <laughs> Maybe <on that>. next time. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. No, but I, I'm, I really appreciate your, your taking the time to share your thoughts about uh, where, where things stand with the restaurant industry and, 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 and with this whole idea. I, I, I've been, you know, if it's not, if it hasn't been clear, I really focused on thinking about community. How do we build community, especially now when we're all, you know, at our desks far away from where we really exactly. want to be. You know? um, there is a, oh, um, 
Let's see. Anyway, so I want to say, um, but thank you very much. So uh, Jana Pastina, for those who, uh, of you who were not here at the very beginning, um, is a uh, co-owner of uh, three restaurants in Oakland, the Chop Bar, Calavera, and Tribune Tavern, um, and very active in, in building community for, for uh, people in, in Oakland and the Bay Area. Um, but I want to um, thank you. And um, we'll put the links to everything in the, in the notes, uh, as we talked about, um, when this is posted on YouTube. So, right. Jonna, thanks. Thanks very much. And we'll see you all, uh, I hope, next week when we have another one of these. Um, that'll feature Amelia Lynn from the San Francisco Chamber of Commerce talking about, we'll be talking more about small business and, and um, some of the challenges facing them. All right. So thanks very much, everyone. Thank you uh, as well. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone.